Oh, are you? And we're finally live with the corset talk. So basically, uh, when posting about my last corset uh, in my Instagram, I received a huge number of questions. Uh, and most of them had um, needed for a much longer reply and maybe um, to show what was happening. So I decided to uh, summon my corset friends, Valentina Pata and uh, Elena from ET Pretty Cuts, uh, to actually show you how it worked, how you can uh, make it work, and uh, well, to actually have some tea, some cake, which we will show you later, and eat a nice deal of tea food <laughs> with our, um, oh, some glasses, okay, uh, while wearing our corsets. So thank you for joining us. And uh, um, should you have a question we're not replying to, uh, feel free to write a comment and my uh, lovely girls will read it and share it and I will try to answer at the best of my abilities. And um, I have also uh, a further purpose I wanted to show, uh, to share with you, which is uh, showing some improvements. Uh, when it comes to social media, you're always, um, you feel like you have to always look perfect, never to admit something was wrong or something like that. So I want to suspend that um, veil of um, forced, forced perfection and to actually show you how some things can be improved because how can you improve, imp yeah, how can you improve something if it's not wrong? And uh, so, well, um, maybe we should wait a bit more to see if uh, someone is joining us. Yes, I will turn my kettle on because, yes, I am making tea. I'm already Cheers, everybody. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere, so. <laughs> Uh, we would like to thank you, actually, Elena, for hosting uh, this uh, this talk on her on her fabulous YouTube channel. Um, maybe you didn't know. You should know. But if you didn't, uh, Elena is currently for some time. She has been reading um, some um, fashion magazines, Italian fashion magazines originals. She got. And she's um, r both reading them and explaining a bit. Uh, for now, they're all read in Italian, of course, since they're Italian. But we got, we're working on all together, and she mainly, we're working on on um, subtitles so everybody can can enjoy the joy. Of yes, five <laughs> um, uh, fashion magazines. Thank you, Elena. I don't speak English, but uh, my contribute uh, of uh, this uh, video is eating and uh, <laughs> drinking, <laughs> okay? Uh, actually, it's, it's way more than that. A lot of stuff that we learned was through Elena's readings, and uh, as she's sharing with us a lot of things that she's learning through these magazines, now we are using that knowledge to share it with you. So it's part, uh, it's um, also her work that you will see here, both theoretically and physically, because she has she makes the most amazing petticoats, and she made a few things for me that I will show you today. And um, another thing I uh, strongly believe in is to support other artisans 
So I'm not wearing uh, my own stuff. I mean, yes, I am wearing stuff I've made, but I am also wearing bits from other people. And I will uh, show you and um, uh, let you know how you can have such magnificent things for yourself. Of course, my kettle is electric, so it will, uh, up, up here I don't have a fire, so it will take just one more minute of annoying noise before we can stop. Uh, grazie a tutti quelli, ho letto anche che uno è le, sono le sette di mattina da lui e ci sta guardando, quindi grazie. Wherever you are, Gillian, thank you for waking up so early on a Sunday. <laughs> thank you very much. Grazie, grazie a tutti, siamo molto, siamo molto felici. We're very happy, thank you. Yes. Also, we remind you uh, that uh, this video will, will be available. We will um, have it available, say, on Anna's channel. So if anyone wants to rewatch it or pass it to someone else or whatever, we will, it will be available after the, the live is, is finished on Anna's channel. Elena, traduci. <laughs> Um, se volete riguardarlo, condividerlo o sì, sì, sarà qua sul mio canale, sempre, quindi... appena finito la live sarà disponibile per riguardare le nostre faccine. So, uh, let's have a bit of boring talk right now. Hi, Ricky from Portugal. Hi. And the boring part is a tiny bit of history and uh, um, of definition. So first thing is, what is a corset? A corset is a reinforced garment which is non-elastic, which is stiff, which cannot be stretched or compressed downwards and uh, which has eyelets to be closed at the back usually or at the front. Corsets are, can be made of uh, heavy material uh, such as brocade or coutil. Coutil is the most common um, corsetry fabric now and it's a very tightly woven fabric. Or they can be made of lighter fabrics such as cotton satines and such. Really a corset does not need to be heavy to be a corset. But um, it can also be made of non-woven materials. For example, there are um, leather corsets uh, and such. So basically it's a garment which usually does not include shoulder straps and that reaches below the waist uh, that uh, can uh, shape your figure because of its structure it shapes the wearer. It's not like a blouse or a shift or something like that, which takes the shape of the wearer. You, um, the corset maker with, uh, with uh, his cut abilities shapes the garment and the garment shapes you. It's not the other way around. So when you feel a corset that does not shape you when you see a corset that looks like a tube but yes it can be a corset but not it's not the main goal of the thing uh, if you bear the discomfort of wearing something that might be stiff you want it to shape you and uh, so yes that's basically roughly a corset what a corset is you can have corset with a front busk you can have uh, corset dresses, you can have a variety of things linked to corsets. Corsets are born in the 19th century. Of course, we had lots of uh, reinforced and stiffed undergarments before that, we, but those are called stays. So basically, if you see something that ends more or less at the waist and has a lot of skirts, which are the tiny bits that split apart below the waist and usually shoulder straps, but that's not mandatory. 
Those are you and a cone shape. Those are usually stays, not corsets. So at the beginning of the 19th century, we have the Regency Napoleonic uh, period, and that is when stays that used to be reach this long start to get shorter, shorter, shorter until you get to a support undergarment that it's basically slightly longer than bra, like this. And after that, mm, they go back, coming longer and longer and longer. And uh, the first one were quite soft with few bones, a uh, front busk made of wood usually, and cording, so uh, cord sandwiched between two pieces of fabric, which is very soft, but has uh, its own structure. And um, so they started reinforcing, again, that shaping undergarment, which is uh, mainly for bust support, and um, it became a corset. And the corset uh, stops being used around the 1910s because the corset starts getting lower and lower. Usually corsets end at the bust line, but uh, around the 1910s, uh, the teens, uh, it starts getting lower and lower and also lower at the hips. The Edwardian corsets go here and then they start getting lower and lower. And uh, the chemise, the thing that used to be worn under the corset, starts getting reinforced or starts getting a support. Um, function for the bust. So basically the corset becomes the guepier or the um, Valentina, the thing that keeps your stockings up, the garter belt. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, this, which is a chemise, uh, this is a princess leaf because it has the chemise, but later, uh, becomes your bra. So that's what a corset is, that's where it comes from comes from and that's where it basically ended. Now let's start uh, talking about what I am wearing now. So this is the very basic late Victorian Edwardian on early Edwardian undergarment set. I am wearing what we call a princess sleep but made my by my dear friend Dario Princiotta which is an, the most amazing corset maker. I am, I, I am having a corset made by him. Uh, I will have it after Christmas, and uh, I can't wait to show you because to show it to you because of fabric. Well, uh, let's go back to. So uh, this is basically a combination of a chemise. Chemise is what was worn under the corset. Corset were never worn on bare skin. Never. When you see it in a movie or in a TV show, it's just to make uh, corsets look more painful or more sexy. So it wasn't done. And this also includes a petticoat. So this is basically a petticoat and a chemise together. Usually, Edwardians and Victorians uh, had uh, two petticoats, and you will see later. Then, underneath, I have just my pair of bloomers, which I made yesterday, and I feel like a uh, sort of turkey with those things going on. And when you, uh, today I will, I will drink a lot of tea, so basically, you, when you wonder how people went to the bathroom with all that, all those layers of clothing, the answer is here, is in the bloomers. Because you see, uh, bloomers are split in the middle. So you basically, if you go down like this, there's, you're free, free to go. All the power <laughs> so you basically lift your skirts up and then just go like this and there you're okay it's nothing complicated nothing impossible 
<laughs> you basically just squat and do whatever you have to. I will show you later, probably. So first thing, <laughs> outrageous. No, I will show you that I will go to the toilet. <laughs> <and then afterwards. laughs> so we have stockings now. And you want to make to wear these before your corset. When it comes to uh, boots and shoes, you always hear this thing, which is corset first, corset first. It's not mandatory. I mean, if you if you have a nice, well-made corset, you can do the other way around. Anyway, you should you should put your boots before your corset usually. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's more comfortable. But, and one of the things we discovered with Elena is that uh, Victorian women shaved, or better, waxed. And uh, mainly on the upper lip and their arms if they had dark hair. But basically, waxing has always been a thing since ancient times. I don't know, maybe at the time, as they didn't have to show their legs, they spared themselves to wax their, that part, but... Yeah, like, like we do in winter. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, well, okay. let's pretend I got my stripes straight. And now, the prince... Ta -da! The corset. So this is a corset I made uh, with uh, an atelier silk pattern, which uh, was the ref F8, I think. Well, I'll have. A, uh, you can read it in my in one of my latest uh, Instagram posts. So basically, this is in silk, and uh, it's an extremely lightweight fabric in this case. I reinforced it with another layer of uh, thin cotton un underneath, but it's a very light fabric. It's not, well, let's see if I can, it's not super thick. I like, my, I like my corsets to be very, very lightweight. So let's put it on. You want it to be laced more or less like this which means you have two loops where the waist is. And on the ends, you can see the uh, bones uh, are shaped according to my body. And you can see there's a waist tape here, which makes, which protects the seams. One of the things that was done back then uh, and that we do not do anymore which is part of the problem, is that we no longer um, allow our corsets to um, shape us little by little. By this, I do not mean that they didn't wear, uh, that we do not wear corset when young, but I just mean that uh, if you worn a corset, you know, after, when you put it on, you feel like a tight hug, if it's well cut. If it's well cut, it's not painful. Uh, and after 10 to 15 minutes, you can, uh, ah, for some, someone, for my, mom's, it's, uh, for my mom, it's half an hour. Uh, you can, you stop feeling it. It starts being more comfortable. So what they usually did, was to tighten up just a bit and then allow it to allow your body to just get used to it for a while. And um, we tended to think that they had only super tight corsets, but that's not true, not at all. Because for this very purpose, at, in, during the morning, they used to wear um, less um, constrictive garments. Look, 
It's not tighten, it's just like a hug. Let's tight it, let's tie it and we'll see. So they had corsets, they had very lightweight corsets. Uh, they had corsets made uh, of um, Aida fabric, which is the embroidery one, which is extremely light, ribbon corsets and um, all that kind of stuff. They had morning, cors morning corsets uh, because in the morning ladies used mostly to um, wear lounge clothing such as wrappers and morning dresses and uh, they used lighter corsets with that, with those, such as with tea gowns. With uh, tea gowns, uh, well, you have formal tea gowns, which are uh, like the one I'll be wearing later, and uh, informal tea gowns that were still considered loungewear. Um, so with those, they had these more comfortable belts. They could have been also lower and such. They had sports corsets. They had summer corsets made of mesh, cotton mesh. And, uh, and those were made strong uh, and non-elastic by the use of tapes and much more boning. But boning does not corset make. It's not the boning that makes the shape. It's always the cut. You have to always remember that. So, um, uh, to read a couple questions. Yes, please, while we wait. So, let's see what we have that we can we can link to this. So, we have a question asking if women used to tailor and uh, sew their own courses, or if they always or mainly bought them. Uh, sorry, if they had help to put them on? No, if they made them themselves. If they no, them. no, no, no. Um, uh, there were many ways of getting a corset. So, um, uh, in the 19th century, we start getting um, department stores and such. And they used, they had shops with corsets. They could order corsets from catalogs. Um, so no, uh, and, or they had them made by a corsetier, which is a specialized tailor that does only corsets. And. Um, I, I studied ballet for more than 15 years, so finding the right corset is like finding the right point shoes. You can you take one and try it, and try it again, try another model, try another pattern, another shape, another company, until you find the right one. The problem is that back then they had huge choice. Right now, the choice um, for ready-to-buy corsets is extremely reduced. So, um, it's not the same uh, that it was back then to buy a ready-made corset. They could choose a corset made for them because it's very important that uh, you think of a corset like something that needs to fit your body and not the other way around. So uh, the fact that it shapes you does not mean that it, that it, can, that it can forget to uh, take in consideration your shape, your proportions and your bones. Uh, because basically every one of us is made differently. So once again, finding something that's ready to buy uh, with, your, with your exact measurements is possible only if you have a very wide choice. Right now we do not have that. So the better option for having the comfort they had back then is to have one made to your measurements. And... Um, it also depends on the flexibility of your um, ribs. 
because everyone or the other day on Instagram uh, there was um, uh, a lady complaining that she could not wear tight corsets because she had one inch of space between her hip bone and, and her rib, ribs. And another one underneath uh, replied that she agreed. She had the same problem. I have the very same distance between my ribs and my hip bones. Very same here. You can count uh, three centimeters. Here you can count three, three centimeters. Here you can count more. But here it's all about flexibility. The rib cage is by nature, especially on, for women, it is flexible. It's extremely flexible. If it weren't flexible, if, if the rib cage wasn't flexible, you would not breathe. <laughs> So you do have flexibility at a minimum. There are some circumstances where flexibility is much less, which, which are scoliosis uh, and uh, osteoporosis, uh, osteoporosis, arthritis and such. So um, in those cases, you can have less flexible things. But in most cases, what I saw when I made corsets for people that claim to be not flexible was just bad cut. Corsets were not cut well, so they couldn't plunge in the waist. And of course, there are there are, some of us are squishy, some of us are not. I am not a very squishy person. Valentina and Elena are neither. There is one of our friends from uh, Reverie that has a very, two friends. One is Dario Princiotta and the other is uh, Laura. And they do not waste train. But Laura, the first time she wore, she put a corset. Ciao, Laura. Ciao. <laughs> she had the tiniest waist because she's so tiny. She, And uh, so, yes, back then uh, they had, there were not squishy person and squishy persons as well, uh, squishy people as well. But what they did mostly was to have good cut, good knowledge of how the body works, good knowledge of uh, how to pose for a photograph. You see, now my corset is not closed. Is it doesn't close at the back, but uh, you see that if I pose like this, my waist looks already tiny, and I I've not yet pulled. You see. In this in this regard, um, Laura actually was asking if um, so. She says. When did waist reduction come into play? I've always seen corsets as mostly shapewear that did not necessarily reduce the waist, but in certain time periods, it seems to be the rule. So, yes, I, I think that mm, well, I'm facing a fashion, a fashion choice for occasion and uh, yes but um, uh, I think the question was on when it was popular yeah sure um, so basically it started uh, the tiny waist started uh, being uh, something fashionable something you wanted to achieve in the 19 in the in the 1840s and then stopped being such uh, in the late 1910s, uh, so right before the 20s. And then again, it became popular again with the uh, 50s and such. But yes, uh, again, it was, uh, as Valentina was telling, it was something you um, adjusted to the occasion. So basically, you could, you could have, you, you had many courses. Uh, one for suitable for the evening, which was 
tinier and one suitable for the uh, morning or for walking or for sport. Can I ask you another question, dear? Yes, please. So um, we have many questions about the shape of the of corsets, mainly the height. So under busts versus how are they called? Over bust. mid bust. Mid bust, over bust. How? Um, if there was difference between usage or other, if, what's what's the difference? What's the what decided uh, what to wear? So, um, well, it is personal taste. There were corsets that were for um, bustier people that reached above the bust line, like here, to give a round shape, but they were nothing like what we can find as sweetheart corsets now. There were mid bust corsets, which were the most popular. I'm wearing one right now, and it's the problem of uh, most commercial low-priced corsets that they are not mid bust. They're supposed to be to reach like here, and they do not do the well. Uh, they do not work. And uh, uh, under busts, um, well, um, I've seen a lot of under busts corset under bust corsets. But they were, um, it's a bit controversial because some are listed as sports corsets, some as morning belts, as, and someone as boudoir corsets. The point is that uh, if you were going outside, walking, if you were seen by someone else in a formal uh, circumstance, you would have worn a mid bust corset or uh, one of the higher ones but not an underbust corset until it was, for example, loungewear or such. And, um, oh, there was another another thing that came to my mind. Oh, my. Another oh. question, while you, while you get to your mind, another question. Um, do we find backbones, the ones next to grommets, always made from spring steel, or can they be made out of different materials like whalebone? Uh, I did not take an exam uh, uh, in a, a wide number of originals, so I do not know. But I would suggest, based on my personal experience, to use spring steel at least for those for bones at the back because um well if you can if you know how to pull the corset correctly which is little bit by little bit have you seen have you as you've seen me doing um they are kept straight but if the corset is less than perfectly constructed cotton you can have the bones bending and uh, the more robust they are the better service they give you um, but for all the rest of the corset by all means use light boning you do not need to make a completely steel boned corset to make a strong and effective garment you can use synthetic whalebone you can even do you can even make a nice corset all with cording but though i would not recommend it so now you can see that i can perfectly sit that i can perfectly talk it's time to show that i can perfectly drink some tea <laughs> We also have questions about how to breathe better in a corset, but I think it just if a corset it fits good, you don't even even need techniques to to breathe. Yes, ideally, <laughs> if a corset is well cut, you do not have that need. But uh, there is a um, suggestion that Elena gave the other day is that uh, nowadays people tend to slouch, and this is not good. This is very, very bad because 
your rib cage, you know, your lungs reach up to here. They start here and they end up here. So when you slouch, you actually compress them. So you deflate them and they're like a sponge for air and blood. So um, you, if you want to increase their ability to absorb air and to exchange oxygen, you want to allow them to have the most volume possible. So basically, you want to have a nice and good posture. Do you see the distance here, how it increases? In this way, I can inflate and deflate my lungs very, very easily. So you want to lean a bit forward like you would do for ballet. You want to keep your shoulders back. So widen, keep a distance here, create distance here. Also, if you slouch, it looks very bad. <laughs> Yes, and especially um, Victorian, late Victorian clothing, but also earlier clothing was not made to slouch because you have all those shoulders attaching backwards uh, if we um, compare it with modern clothing. So you see, if I keep a good ballet posture, my shoulder blades are a bit closer than usual, so my sleeves can attach a bit backwards. Next step is to wear shoes. In this case, I'm wearing a pair of slippers, a pair of shoes that was appropriate for uh, to be worn at home not something that you would have walked in, though I've used them for everything. If you go outside, you want a pair of boots on, uh, or a pair of shoes with gaiters. Hmm. Can Let I ask another that... question? No. Sorry? Next thing. Um, sometimes uh, they used padding to increase uh, the hips, because the more the wider the bust and the hips look, the tinier the waist looks. It's an optical illusion. So last year we went to see, or maybe it was at the beginning of this year, um, an exhibition uh, of Boldini's paintings. And uh, there were some original work gowns. And uh, one of these evening gowns had the most extreme hips, something that was not humanly possible. So this is the answer. This was made by, um, on Instagram, you can find her as Marie Teresa and Lumieres, while on Facebook and on Etsy, she is Marie the, uh, the Boudoir Key. She also makes very nice corsets, and I have—I can pr proudly say I have one. And this is her hip improver. Hip improvers came in a variety of shapes and sizes. So you had some that reached up to the hips, some that were just uh, a little below back here. So what do you want? Mm, it's up to how your body is shaped and how, uh, which is the silhouette you want. So basically, if you have a nice set of round hips, but you just want to fill the gap between your butt cheeks, where your sacrum is, basically here, in late Victorian fashion, you do not want a flat area between your butt cheeks. You want it to be all round. So you want to use a small bustle pad which has volume here. In Edwardian times, you may want to increase the hips. You may want to do that for late Victorian stuff as well, according to the shape of the dress. So now you see me doing something that might be weird to some 
especially if you've only used commercial corsets so far. Uh, you see that I am not lacing everything tightly. I am in fact using a small hook here that existed in most uh, uh, antique corsets, which is made exactly for this. You see how the hip pad continues my hip line. That's what this is made for, to create a curvy, a nice curve to the silhouette. You do not want it to go like this, because if you do like, if you go like this, you see that it fills the waist. So it increases the volume here. So here, let's go. Um, I go and uh, get a measuring tape. In the meantime, I just wanted to remind everyone who makes very beautiful hip improvers, that's our friend. Elena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now we have 77 centimeters and a half. If I go up here, give me a second, please. If I keep it up here, it's already 70 centimeters. So if you add this and then you add a petticoat and then you add um, uh, the waistband of the skirt and then on top a bodice, maybe the bulkiness of a, sh um, a shirt waist, you easily gain even eight centimeters if you do not make a very thin waistband. Sorry, so dear, not... you say from 70, 70, 70 to 80? 80. 80, yes. Okay. Let me check. Maybe I got the wrong time. Okay. Sorry, this is 78. While this is eighty one. Okay, thank you. So it's easy to add bulk, and it's not bulk yet because I not measured. I did not measure over here. It's just that the tiny point is here. If I put something here, I need to measure the waist above. So you get, <sighs> doesn't work. <laughs> so use hooks. And then we can go and properly tie it. I had a question about uh, tummy, I mean the volume of your tummy. Is it right that when I use a corset, uh, I have a sort of lower belly muffin top? Yes, because corsets move the volume of your body. They do not make it disappear. So basically, they do not do magic. <laughs> your volume is still there. One thing that you can do to um, actually reduce the volume is to waist strain. Because by waist training, you, um, well, that's a complex um, subject, but it's worth replying. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to wear the most magnificent petticoat, which E.T. Pretty Cuts Elena made from, from last year. And basically, um, we are made uh, of muscles and bones that um, are made to support our personal weight. And we have muscles that are made to move, like the ones in the legs, most of the ones in the legs and the arms. But there are other muscles that are more supple, let's say 
muscles that, uh, without lots of effort, keep us standing for a long time. And those uh, are muscles we control much less, such as the muscle around your spine, the ones that protect your spine and make you stand. What uh, um, waist training does is um, taking away the weight of your body and instead of allowing the muscles to hold it, they, uh, the corset brings the weight, bears the weight. So um, those muscles, when not used, start decreasing in size. So you're, when you do lace uh, tight, uh, when you do waist training, which is wearing the, core, the tight corset for more than eight hours a day, every day, um, you do not get thinner, you do not shape your body, you sh not in a good way, I mean. You just make your back weaker. There are ex active exercises that help you shape your waist, which were popular in the 1950s, which are the ones with the um, diagonal muscles, diagonal abdominals and the uh, transversus, um, deeper abdominals, uh, ab muscles, yes. I'm sorry, I know all of this in Italian and sometimes translating is not the easiest thing. So now, uh, Elena's court, Elena's petticoat is absolutely delightful. It's made in silk taffeta with a reinforced back. And uh, as you can see, the waistband is cut, uh, is not cut straight, but it was made for another corset, which means that now if I close it where it's supposed to go, it does the thing we discussed before. You see how my waist is up here? Meanwhile, you want your Victorian waist to be like this. So I will have this set for my new pair, for my new corset, and in the meantime, I will use a pin, which was done back in the days. You can also choose to add hooks at the back of your corset. Some originals have them. So now you see, my petticoat does the work, keeps my train from stepping from uh, keeps me from stepping on my train but is also kept off the waist now we have questions before we go on yes yes sorry i'm going on i'm talking talking talking, talking sorry we know you. we know you you're like a train we're talking about corsets so uh we got a couple questions so what kind of corset would you suggest for 19th century plus size women? Um, basically, it depends. It's not about being plus size or, or very skinny. It's about the ratio between your natural waist, your uh, bust and your hips. Because if you have you can have a uh, hundred centimeters of bust measurement, but you can have uh, a C cup, an E cup, or an A cup, which means the difference is on how big your bust is and how big your um, rib cage is. Yeah, As the bust, measure. the bust can be squished more than your rib cage. So, you want to uh, consider this ratio. And once you choose, once you uh, acknowledge your ratio, you can find which are the squishy parts and how squishy you are on the waist and uh, the ratio on the corset you want made for you. I suggest to uh, make um, a lot of mock-ups and to have a look 
even on Pinterest, on plus size uh, corsets or uh, antique corsets. Because um, you can see how they managed. They, you, they didn't squish much. They just shaped the uh, fat, which is, in Victorian times, it's something good because it's easier to redistribute fat, body fat, than um, a very muscular person. Uh, athletes are very hard to shape with a corset because muscles do not do well with corsets. So, for example, I can achieve such an extreme um, silhouette without being extra squishy because I have my round tummy because I'm not super skinny. If you're super skinny, you need to be one of the squishy person to get a tiny waist. If you're not, you get to be extremely more comfortable. Another question is, if someone has a big difference between hips and waist, is it necessary to wear padding under the corset or could it be worn over or is it just personal preference? It's a personal preference, but if you do have, well, uh, we have to consider uh, padding uh, as, it really depends on the type of padding. I have always seen, uh, I've mostly seen um, back padding worn above the corset because it's the, um, uh, it comes from bustles and all that type of undergarment, which gets um, smaller and smaller with time. So it makes sense that it's above the corset, but there were also padded corsets. It really depends on what you want to achieve and how it works best for you. In the meantime, I'm wearing a lovely corset cover made by ET Pretty Goods. What does a corset cover do? Basically, it creates a rounder shape here. It protects the corset from uh, um, rubbing. Yes, so ideally this would be like this, but right now it's my fault, it's not, the petticoat was perfect with the other corset. I'm wearing it like this just because I made a new corset and I want to give it off the waist. And now the dress. Of course, I have to dress like a lady, so um, I cannot close the dress on myself alone. I will ask my husband to help me. Marco? <laughs> Marco? <laughs> okay. Ciao, Marco. <laughs> He's the most patient man in the world. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Il corpino di E.T. Petticoats, Petticoats, it's, it's very beautiful, sì, il corpino di Elena è bellissimo. Yes, yes, yeah. an excellent job in remaking that. So this is my tea gown, it's made, um, it's inspired by the blue and um, green flock brocade one uh, that were made for uh, Countess Greffel, Greffel uh, in 1986, I think. But I could not find, well, that's an almost impossible to find brocade. So I found this nice purple one and I uh, created something similar. So this is not a loungewear. This is for tea, but to be worn at home, but it's but it's uh, but it's uh, formal. While Valentina and Elena are wearing garments that are suitable for being worn outside of home, 
walking dresses. Ma eh, coronavirus. Mm-mm. Well, as yes, coronavirus uh, prohibited, prevented us from using them in Venice and have our walks and our usual meetings, we chose to wear what we loved today. Let's see if we have other questions. Well, there were many questions about the back hooks. The? Back hooks. Okay, so they basically were uh, large hooks, like two centimeters uh, large hooks. Uh, to be attached below the waist um, where your um, eyelets are or just at the side of the eyelets. So you pass the petticoats um, waist tape behind, uh, underneath those to be sure that the petticoat is not pulled up. And also the corset, the corset um, tape. Yes, you can lace the corset at the back uh, in a peculiar way. I do not have a corset with that uh, closure now, but I will have one. Uh, and um, basically, uh, they also used it to tie, to pass the two. Um, laces on the back hooks lower than the waist and to tie them underneath the waist like here so uh, to avoid bulk even more so they had such attention on av- on uh, avoiding bulk there that it makes no sense that nowadays we're squishing ourselves into corsets just to get uh, a non a tube like silhouette of course perfetto amore mio sta abbastanza bene perfetto ti meriti una fetta di torta thank you thank you um, another quick question before while you cut the cake Mm-hmm. What's the best way to store corsets? Oh, I'm going to show you right now. Just give me a second. I'm pouring some. Okay, this is your cake. And you also have tea. <laughs> yes. For once, uh, he he's adorable. He's my, he's my sweetheart, sweetheart. Because he always brings me tea. And just one second, I'm going to see how you uh, show you how to fix the um, back of the petticoat. There you go. My pretty juicy one. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. So you can see my tiny waist now, right? Yes. (laughs) Very. (laughs) And so basically now I have this super wide train and the petticoat. And um, they had ribbons or hooks and such to keep them. I usually add when I'm on my own because I would need someone else to pin the skirt for me. I use a pin hidden so it keeps them together. And they also had made sewing them in. So now we have this. Yes. I'm not sure I got the center, but it gives a nice idea, I think. No, I didn't get the center. Well, I would need a maid. But you see now how we Jazeera, where are you, Jazeera? And you see that with the petticoat on, the train keeps at the back. So it's now time to reply to the remaining question, but most of all, to sit and finally enjoy my cake. Yeah, cake! <laughs> Elena, vuoi raccontarci qualcosa nel frattempo? 
<ride> mi sentivo tripla um, beh, cosa dire sono molto emozionata devo essere sincera <ride> e, e, no, eh, no. Non, so se non lo so non lo faccio vedere lo so Quando la live sarà finita provvederemo a mettere dei sottotitoli in modo che sia comprensibile anche in italiano per chi non parla in inglese. Sì, assolutamente. Ma non finirà, sarà infinito. Eh, sì. Faremo un lavoro infinito. Va bene. Ci spaventa per caso? Assolutamente no. Anyway, Elena was going to show you Dicevi che volevi mostrare come si chiude il corpino? Come si apre? Perché ormai ce l'ho su. So, uh, Elena now will show you um, how her body is closed. Elena, fai un lento giro su te stessa così che facciamo vedere. Ok. So, Victoria... E anche mettiti grande. Sì, mettiti grande. Ok. Uh. Ok. Eh, non so se... Allora, aspetta. <ride> Devo rimanere in ginocchio a terra, ma va bene. Va bene, va bene. Sali un po'. Sali un po'. <ride> so, Sali. basically, you do not see where it's closed, because the closure is extremely tricky. And she did an amazing job, and now you're going to see it. <ride> Ready? Ok, <ride> Um, little button for color, another button, another, 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 and this, this, this. That's magic! Stop. <laughs> and then it has hooks and eyes until uh, right straight at the front. That's beautiful, I didn't see it! Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> ah. Get dressed now! <laughs> Uh, do we have any more questions maybe on YouTube? Let's see if we got something different. Do we want to talk briefly about uh, um, Corset myths and other stuff like that. Mm. Maybe. So basically, well, you've just seen you have just seen that I ate a large slice of cake, right? And this is my second cup of tea, maybe the third, and I'm getting another slice of cake and at least another two cups of tea. So where does the food goes? 
also also what what we do usually when we get together in costume is basically eat and we we don't eat like little birds we can assure you no 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 we, we love eating um we live in italy so it starts with well eat a little <laughs> and there's a reason for that yeah and uh we enjoy food a lot so when we go out we usually go and uh well, the funniest part is to be together during lunch and chatting and having our um spritz in the afternoon and uh having breakfast together mostly eating frittelle during carnevale and uh, so yes we like enjoying time together more than uh, all the rest because i think that's the fun part and we enjoy doing that in costumes but um, we got to a place uh, where we feel quite okay with our costumes and we can enjoy ourselves which is nice because i'm not i know uh you should totally be able to enjoy this kind of hobby or job uh without feeling the pressure of always being perfect but um for me it doesn't feel that way i can relax if i feel i have uh, my costume is okay and um uh, so that's what was uh, that was what I mentioned. If you have a corset, you tend to burp, <laughs> and you all, obviously a lady does not do that. But you need to be prepared that we uh, that happens a lot. Um, and why is that? Basically, you have your digestive system, which is a sort of long tube with um, spaces like a tunnel with caves at some point and but they're all made they're all squishy i mean it's all made of human uh organic matter and it's uh, extremely flexible basically uh you have your stomach which is slightly uh pushed up like many other organs and many many other organs are pushed down and un uh, underneath uh, in your pelvis there is a lot of space especially uh, the thing you take away from your waist goes below and it still keeps working it still does you still go and need to be uh, the only thing I well of course you do not um, breathing uh, you breathe perfectly as you can see and you sit perfectly and you eat and drink perfectly. It's just, mm, it's just that you are wearing something stiff. It's like a strong hug. And um, yes, basically the blood, uh, blood keeps flowing because it's too internal, the main vessels are too much on the inside to be squished extra and you're fine you're totally fine and uh the one thing is that you're less hungry when wearing a corset and you um you stop being hungry um uh, sooner when you are because your stomach is uh a bit Pushed maybe a bit pushed upwards and so you feel like it's full sooner but and you well you just need to get used to it <laughs> I mean it's not uh, you see I'm still talking I'm not fainting I'm I can do the stairs I can walk from one side to the other of Venice. I've eaten one gigantic slice of apple cake, which I have to say, uh, it, it got, uh, it came out pretty well today. We also we usually want to get to, to Venice to just enjoy ourselves. We usually walk for mm -hmm. miles, seven, eight kilometers. You know, <laughs> 
wearing proper historically uh, reproductions of shoes and of course and everything so we got a couple other questions that uh, one is from what age did women wear corset well they started uh, very young there were um, uh, so the point is that corsets come from stays basically and stays were worn since a very young age as they were considered part of the clothing but they were usually not very restrictive. We have some, um, I have a book which has a couple of examples of children corsets and they're basically tubes. Well, they have no waist reduction. I think they started adding a bit of waist reduction um, during teenage years, uh, first maybe 13, 14 years maybe. 10, but mm, not a very young age. Elena, hai qualcosa da dirci in proposito? Corsetti per gio giovanette? Sì, sì, assolutamente. Li mettevano fin da piccolissime, fin da piccole, comunque, anche... Allora, aspetta, non immaginiamoci il corsetto che ha appena messo Chiara, ovviamente erano mh, alcuni erano fatti anche uncinetto cioè secondo me era una sorta di preparazione mm -hmm. comunque prima o poi li avrebbero messi anche per Elena ha detto extremely in, uh, interesting which is that in her magazines she found that some young girls corsets were crocheted Made with crochet, so they were basically stretchy and they were not tight or restrictive. They were just to start feeling something hugging you. Ecco, non immaginiamoci delle bambine all'interno di corsetti steccati. Ecco. So no boning, but just a very light shape where we can say. Yeah. So another question, Chiara, if you if you can stop eating now. <laughs> if I will can... never stop eating. I would die if I stopped eating. <laughs> the um, little monkey, our dear little monkey, is asking. I'm turning twenty this Friday. Uh, happy birthday in, in advance. And I would like to start wearing a corset. What is a good way to start? <laughs> Well, the main problem with corsets is that the best corset for you is always made by a skilled corset maker who knows your body. Uh, you're, probably, you're probably young, you're pro probably strong and at the best of your body's health, so you can dare a bit especially um, younger, the younger you are, the more flexible you are. So maybe- You are young. <laughs> oh my gosh. So um, don't be afraid. I think I started wearing my first corsets when I was, well, I had my first corset when I was 17, 16 maybe. 16, 17, and uh, it was a um, commercial corset. Uh, what was the brand? It was one of those you can find in Camden Town, but it was steel boned, had very little waist reduction, and I loved wearing it at high school. And since then, I've always worn them now and then. So, as long as you do not want to do waist training, which is again wearing a corset eight hours per day. And for that, you need to hear a doctor first because it's not something, taking away support to your spine is not something that one wants to do lightly. And so, 
at first you want to buy something you can afford probably if you if, if it's the same that happened to me so there are there's a nice brand um, i think it's polish um restyle we, restyle yes and i got one of those is very good they do not do over busts they do under busts if, if it's still like that but their patterns are lovely they are quite wide at the hips and they're well cut and constructed so they tend to hug you very well and uh, create uniform pressure so you do not have problems i've had problems with the ones from corset story back then they're Commercial corsets um, are the only uh, corsets that you buy to size and not to measure are the only ones that ever gave me bruises or problems or anything. So if you can, have a corset made. If not, start with uh, something like Restyle. They make ni very nice corsets. They don't, they don't cost too much. they like, what was it, like 60 euros or something? Yes, with shipping, they're less than 100 euros. Yeah. A uh, couple other things. If you have any commercial button recommendations or books for, for drafting corsets, and if you have um, tips for drafting your own corset. Hmm. Well, the best resource for corset making and people who want to learn how to draft their own corsets is Foundations Revealed. Otherwise, um, Barbara from Royal Black has a, a very lovely set of tutorials. Among the, and among those, you have a couple of them on how to draft your own corset and assemble it properly and her techniques uh, her technique is simply divine among the best you can find so learn from the best and uh, then just experiment don't be afraid and make lots of more cups <laughs> <laughs> as with everything as with everything you have to make not like me, you have to make lots of mock-ups and, and the base. Yes, all of our mistakes are, come from not making enough mock-ups because we, uh, we, <laughs> we, our pro problem is excessive enthusiasm for the finished thing. <laughs> And then we end up making things two, three, four, five times. Mm -hmm. mm. I made this dress, I think, three years ago, and uh, I <laughs> I finished altering it right before this call started. I mean, I mm, moved. Um, I altered, I shortened the shoulders, I moved the sleeves twice, I remade the neck, the collar, because it didn't fit right, it wasn't high enough, it was pulling me at the back. I changed the, changed the uh, sleeves again and uh, I remade the back closure. So I do not like wearing things once, I like wearing them over and over and over and um, I like clothing that's a living thing so changes with you improves with your skills um, it's not that because it didn't come out perfect the first time uh, I have to wear it like this you can improve it and uh, take it uh, open it remake it again Mm, not necessarily trash it because it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect and adjusting with time is uh, one of the best ways to learn. And nothing is ever done. Mm. Uh, 
um, our dear friend Alberto, <laughs> hi Alberto, <laughs> is asking about men's corset in the 1980s and 90s. Yes, men did wear corsets. And you have a lot of paintings and photographs. Oh, yes, we have to speak about photographs. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes, because I use the photoshopped image as um, to promote these things. So I have, and I did it on purpose. So we have to explain why. Well, can men. We share pictures? Hmm? Uh, can we share? Maybe we can we can share uh, our um, our screen with the pictures. Our we ask our technical help. <laughs> so when. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Men did wear corsets. Um, not all of them. It was a thing of fashion, fashionable men like dandies and such. But and also working men, men who did hard work, had extra, had had corset belts for extra support. But for example, you see many pictures, uh, many paintings of um, Hans Josef. Um, uh, Elizabeth of Austria's husband, uh, the emperor, uh, when young, with a curious shape when wearing uniforms and uh, an extremely tiny waist. And that was probably where, from wearing corsets. So um, it was just like wearing padding now on uh, your shoulders. Getting to a fashionable silhouette. It was nothing to be ashamed of. And uh, if I can say wearing uh, corset, corsets uh, is something that can give you a very striking period look. Uh, however, men's corsets were uh, not as tight as women's. They did not uh, strive for that uh, super tiny waist uh, in the late Victorian times. Earlier times, maybe yes, but not in late Victorian ones. And um, so do not think as uh, to, uh, of corsets, of men's corsets as something uncomfortable, something you cannot wear. And consider wearing one for a um, tailcoat or evening wear. Just once, try, mm -hmm. fun. And they uh, danced, women and men danced with corsets, very tight evening wear corsets. They danced galops, polkas, thing with jumps, thing that, things that uh, take your breath away. <laughs> and not because of corsets. <laughs> and they didn't die. Well, uh, another question is, how have you experienced sitting in a corset concern in the legs? What was the polite way to pose your legs, uh, the brim cutting into the thighs when sitting? Actually, I don't. I never had that kind of problem because maybe... Uh, because corsets burning usually ends uh, where you're, where you... Uh, bend your legs. So boning is not supposed to plunge into your thigh or anything like that. For example, now I'm super comfortable. Well, maybe the corset can end lower, like in the 19, 19 uh, like in the teens. But uh, the boning usually, especially at the front, stops higher. Hey, cosa ci fai tu qua? Ciao piccolino. Ciao piccolino. He's corseted too. Have you seen such a tiny waist? Look at so him. If, uh, if a corset uh, is is uh, uncomfortable yeah. on your legs, it just means it's either too long or the um, the bones, the boning is too long. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> no. Ah. So blue. Terra. Fermo. Bravo. Such a good form. Yes, uh, Photoshop then. Oh, uh, yeah. When you see, and then I want to talk about uh, 
you girls please remind me to do that about padding and Leon de Bougie. Okay. So when we see uh, pictures of royals and influential women uh, or socialites or actresses and models and such of days back then, why? They uh, were usually photoshopped. I mean, they did not have Photoshop, but they used to pose in a certain way, as I've shown, I've shown you before, and to pose against a solid color background, usually white or black. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, on top of that, you can use the white or black paint or either scratch away a whole area of the body. For example, if I, have, if I pose like this, you can cut away here, just a tiny area, to make my waist look even thinner. If you, A, no, if you look at photo, photographs of Polea, for example, you can see that uh, she was extremely tiny waisted. She had blue, she had an extremely tiny waist, but all her pictures we find now are photoshopped. Can you show the picture again? Puoi mostrarla di nuovo? Grazie. If you zoom in the picture, you can see that at the sides of her waist there is a sort of halo where they let me see where they basically erased. Yes, you can see on the right side of the image a sort of white halo where there's the um, uh, darker area in the background. And that's Photoshop of the age. That's basically, there you, you can see it, you can clearly see it. And uh, they did that a lot. They erased wrinkles, they uh, made the arms slimmer, they made waists smaller. And uh, so don't always get frightened when you see an extremely tiny waist because if you reconstruct the image uh, filling those halos, you can actually see that it's a normal figure. Ah, ah, blue, Ju. Also the thing with, with the corsets that you may know, you may have seen, is that from the front you get a very tiny waist and from, but from the side, you actually are wider than usual. Yes, when you uh, get um, uh, an RMI, you get all those slices of your body. When you see slice of the waist area, it's oval, it's elliptical, it's flat at the front and the back. While uh, when, we're, when wearing a corset, you get uniform pressure on all the points of the area. So instead of having a waist like this, it gets rounder. So it gets deeper here, but and, tiny, and tinier here. So it's not about the measurement of the waist. It's how you pad, it's how the corset is constructed and uh, it's how you pose for example if i pose like this if i pose like this it's very 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 different this creates uh, such a different waist for example if i did like this it's not the same i have to do like this to enhance and in edwardian times they had uh, for example super long pearl necklaces that uh, ax created an accent around the waist made it look even thin even smaller so a lot of optical illusion was going on, a lot of Photoshop, a lot of posing, because right posing. I mean, if I do like this, no matter how nice the dress is, I look bad. I have to pose like this. It's very important. It's very, very, very important. You have to carry it yourself. And uh, it's one thing that, um, Socialites uh, and Demi Mondain uh, were very aware of. Uh, so they were mostly actresses, singers, models, so they knew how to look good. And uh, a lot of them are forgotten nowadays, but 
um, if you see a very fancy photo, it's either a noble or uh, a sugar in some way. And I wanted to talk about showgirls uh, in terms of padding, because um, did they all wear padding? No. Did they all have this extreme ratio between, between waist and hips? No, not at all. For example, um, there was this very important courtesan, high-end prostitute, one of the richest women of her time, which was, uh, who was Léane de Pougy. Léane de Pougy was bisexual, uh, everyone knew that, and she was famous for her androgynous figure. Uh, she had uh, an almost boyish face, she was very thin, she didn't have a lot of bust, she, and she liked to um, emphasize that. So she, you would not have found her with extreme hip padding or bust padding, because uh, they did also pad the bust. They used ruffled corset covers, they used bust improvers, they used bone cages, they used padded things, and everything they could to uh, shape the final silhouette into what was fashionable. They did not say, oh, I do not have much bust. Who cares if you're not a busty girl? Pad like a drag queen. <laughs> well, the same works as with, with uh, we were talking the other day with hair. We were mm -hmm. uh, watching um, fashion magazines and catalogs for, for buying stuff that had very big and um, they had very and uh, fake hair or let's say um, how are they called uh, rats rats and yes. uh, half wings they had whole wings, half wings. Half wings. and stuff because not everyone had very long very full hair also of course someone has thick hair someone has not and they did whatever they could if they could afford it to have the fashionable hair as as we do now with extensions and stuff exactly. but even more exactly there are magazines that elena found out uh, that have wigs half wigs whole hair pieces covering half of the head and when you find hairstyling tutorials most of them show women with hair reaching half the uh, half their back. The ones who, when we we are talking about late Victorian and Edwardian times, um, having that myth of the extremely long hair was already a fake. I mean, previous eras had uh, this fetish for long hair. When we come to Edwardian and late Victorian, we have women posing pretending to have uh, long, extra long hair, while it was extremely um, accept socially accepted that hair were almost all fake. For example, um, this wig is the very same wig I've worn uh, for Carnevale this year, but I have restyled it. Why? Because it had too much and too long hair. It was, it has, it had so much volume, he didn't work for the correct hairstyle all the time. So this thing that you need to have extra long hair is overrated, as it's overrated the average hairstyle of the, uh, I call it the donut hairstyle, which is padding all around the head and uh, a chignon, a bun. Uh, but that's, well, I think we have to fight stereotypes when it comes to um, reenacting and reconstructing the history and uh, to uh, diversify. Diversify, yes. 
and to add some variety. I am actually writing a book about hairstyles and hair uh, in the late Victorian and early Edwardian. It's not, um, it's not about um, how you should do, but it's about adding variety. And our problem is always variety and proportions when doing hair. Also when doing dresses, because we do not have the same eye for proportion, we have to train us more and more and more to have the same proportions. And um, we tend to stereotypes. So we say, oh, they all had hair like that. They all had hair, like, uh, for example, 90s hair were all pulled up. No, they were not. Uh, there, there are hairstyles with middle parting and waves at the side like uh, Cleo de Merode used to wear and all such things. So um, I think we always need to get out of what we think is appealing to the modern eye and research first get your eye trained to the taste of the time first then choose pottery and uh try to if you've seen someone doing something you would like for yourself find a way of doing it your way find a different resource uh, find don't do the dress everyone has made unless you know you can do it better or find something more interesting let's create more variety because i always see the same hairstyles the same type of dresses everyone is making things after the same photographs the same patterns and uh we're getting we're closing the amazing fashion of that of those times inside a stereotype and that's a very bad thing because there's such there's so many amazing things one can do there what are so many resources to to look at fashion magazines not only not only the museum pieces that are more the most famous and stuff but fashion magazines and even uh, original photographs of course they're not in color but you can say if you can see shapes you can see hats you can see trims you can see lots of things and you can, there are, we have found the um, the worth catalog for all of these all of these uh, dresses with the, also the descriptions of the colors and of and the fabric you can and also you can also see different proportions because i see everyone doing flat hats for 1990s while they're way they were higher. I see everyone with the brim of their hat lower here for uh, the early 20th century. I see very large hats for uh, the first years of the 20th century. No. Eh, scusa, eh, volevo attaccarmi un attimo al discorso uh, dei video in bianco e nero. Uh, fanno anche video colori. Non prendeteli molto in considerazione perché usano quasi sempre colori pastello e no. Yeah, <laughs> Basically, do never trust colorized pictures or videos because they use they are um, taking the stereotype of the pastel color or the dark color or the neutral tones Victorian or Edwardian era while they were crazy for colors. They were, they had the most striking and weird color combinations and... Anche nelle sottogonne! Even <laughs> for petticoats, petticoats and undergarments were colored. Corsets were colorful. Petticoats <laughs> were colorful. <laughs> non si vede, sembra bianco. <laughs> oh no! It's Lila, it's Lila come back. Yes. So, do we have any more questions, or we can? Uh, I don't think so. Let me see. Uh, um, you didn't answer corset storage. Oh yes. Sorry, I have to rub my corset. I didn't glue my wig properly. I'm sorry. Something I 
I have to get the patience to do that. So. Amica, spediteme una fetta di torta, per favore. Eh. <laughs> ah. I like to do it like this. So you have a hanger, you have the lacing, you just do this. There you go. And uh, corsets were usually um, rolled up and stored in very, very uh, tiny, um, thin and long cardboard boxes. Um, it's important you can do that as well, but it's very important that you allow your corset to breathe, especially if you've worn it all day and uh, moisture, well, the sweat stops on the chemise and um, you don't get the smelly sweat on the corset. Uh, the um, smell remains on the first layer, which is why it's so important to wear at least one chemise because you cannot wash the corset because of the metal parts. You can only dry clean it and it's not enough sometimes. So uh, you want it to breathe. It's very important. Especially when it's 35 to 5 degrees and you're walking under the sun in vents. Cosa? Especially if you wear it when it's 35 degrees and you're walking in the sun in vents. So, my, I had one liter of tea here. Uh, my husband drank uh, a mug of it and I ate the rest. Here we have nipple cake. I ate two thirds of what's left of what uh, has gone away. So basically, I will not dine tonight. But uh, I think we have proved that you can breathe, you can talk, you can eat. Well, uh, let's do something funny. Uh, well, I, let me show you how Dave went to the toilet. Uh, have you seen that when I laced my corset at the back, uh, the loops you create when you tie it in a bow, where I pulled them long enough so that they were as long as the leftover, if it makes sense. So I will show you with... This is too short. Let me grab a ribbon. So for my corsets, I like to use this. It's a braid. It's a braided cord. It's in polyester. When I can, I use the cotton one um, when I find it. So um, it's like shoelaces, shoestrings. I will just do the knot. So I have a lot of cord at the sides. I just do like this. You see? Yeah. They are equally long now. And so basically you do not step on your corset. If it's too, well, I use four or five, usually five meters, it's better to of a cord to lace my corsets. So I never end up with lots and lots of um, cord. You want just enough to um, be, be, to wrap yourself with a, laced part all open just to comfortably close if you can close the corset comfortably and there's a meter of um, string at one side 
you need to cut it shorter. But you have to calculate how short, how long, when the corset is all open, not when it's closed. I once heard uh, a person who was supposed to work in corset uh, in a... Um, she said that you have to pull the pull the strings and then cut them. No. Um, how, do you, how do you take it off? Uh, exactly. So <laughs> uh, I will show you how you would go to the toilet, and you will see nothing. So basically, you pull the train up. I like to do like this. You pull the back up. Now you pull up your princess sling or your petticoats above your back. And now you just go to the toilet, you sit. And if your bloomers are made right, you will have no problem <laughs> The way it will be clear. Sorry for the. And you're good to go. So it's not rocket science. It's something you can basically just do. And if you hold the train all in one hand, you can use toilet paper with the other. And uh, uh, a last question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people go for certain looks more because of sources available? M like most people are familiar with the V&A and Smithsonian extant, extant garments because they are the most accessible. Uh, I think it's more... Um, well, nowadays we have both Instagram and Pinterest, which are... Um, dangerous if wrongly used, but also extremely useful if you can date a picture just by the looks and if you're not fooled by the wrong day, uh, wrong year uh, wrong yeah. day. so uh, you can find vintage uh, antique catalogs on Pinterest you can find very reliable and uh, interesting different various resources you just have to spend some time and look for them and uh, i think the problem with um, dresses looking a bit uh, the same is because we um, tend to go for commercial patterns only we have lost their way the way they had to take something and improvise, take a little from this, a little from another. Fashion but fashion plates were made as inspiration, and then people could make identical things or take a thing from the previous one, a uh, thing from the latter, and mix them and create something fashionable uh, for their own eyes. Though they also had the description on how to make exactly the very same garment with the shade of, uh, of color and the type of fabric. Uh, nowadays, we have the uh, pattern, the commercial pattern. We are barely capable of uh, fitting to our measurements, keeping the proportions of the original pattern or the original garment, which is why I would hate to make patterns because people cannot fit them in most cases. And you get, in the end, something so incredibly different from the original that sometimes even surprising. Sorry, I, I I sound so harsh in this. I'm sorry. Um, a pattern is a start. Then you have to make it yours. If you want to make an exact replica of something made from patterns of fashion, um, um, books, because you want to do an exercise, it's okay perfectly fine if you want to uh, learn new things and such. But I see people buying simplicity patterns and doing the same dress in orange, in blue, 
no, never in orange. Orange is not, it was an extremely fashionable color back then. Nobody uses. I see it in blue, in pink, lilac when we're lucky, and uh, maybe one striped fabric if they found it as um, leftover or disc or on sale. And I find a lot of solid colors while they had the wildest patterns going on. <laughs> wildest, very, very wild. Yes. <laughs> so um, we, lo we have lost imagination because now we do not have to make clothing. We just have to buy it. So we um, give it for granted that pattern we buy, we spend some money on a pattern, so it's ready to use. No, pattern is a guide, just the beginning. You then need to fit it properly, to make alterations, to make it yours, give the thing some taste, some flavor, your flavor. And while- Add, trends, add details, weird colors, weird, <laughs> weird pairings. <laughs> That is one of, the, that's the problem with them. That's um, one of the problems I have with the things I see around. But there are also loads and lo loads and loads of talented, pe talented people doing amazing things. So. One well, last question, if you can repeat, you, if you can spell the name of the bisexual wealthy woman, uh, Lian de Puji. L I A N E D E P O U G Y. Comunque lo scrivo dopo. Grazie. And if you know the movie or the book, Sherry, Sherry by Colette, uh, the one with Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, the movie, uh, it was rumored that Leon was the inspiration for the main character. Okay. We got something else to say? If there are no more questions, not really, no. Okay. I would really, really, really like to thank all of you for listening to me blabbering about uh, <laughs> late Victorian uh, fashion and about corsets. And as you see, I'm really healthy. I can move, I can dance, I can drink, I can eat. And uh, so I, if you've seen this live, please, please, please stop saying those things like how did they breathe, how did they move, how did they, they went to, they uh, rode bicycles, they went hiking, they went uh, horse riding, they played tennis with corsets on. So it's just a modern, it's just because I've gone with the wind and all such things that nowadays we still have such problems. Corsets are not the most comfortable garment, but if well made, you can have a very normal life with them. And uh, you can get a tiny waist even if you don't corset train daily. Even wearing a corset every 15 days, like me. For us, as you can see, all the other all, uh, the other two girls here have a lovely silhouette as well. The point of the Victorian and Edwardian silhouette is to have an angle here. These two lines do not go down straight, and then the hips open up. This is very, very, very important. After today, please, no more tubes. Thank you. <laughs> Nessuno sta dicendo che è più comodo di mettersi in tuta. Però non ci moriamo dentro. 
ma neanche un paio di scarpe di tacchi 13 sono comodi, voglio dire. Esatto, io preferisco indossare un corsetto piuttosto che un paio di tacco 13. Yes, it's going to be more comfortable on the long term and if you have to um, endure a long walk, uh, it's better to have a corset than high heels sometimes. So we still do get some forms of torture uh, because of fashion. Yeah, but luckily no one is, is telling us to do it. So we can always do whatever well, we want. Uh, neither they did back then. I mean, exactly. wearing a corset was mandatory, yes. Wearing a tight corset was not. You had noble women, royal women that um, had uh, normal waists with a corset. And then you have uh, Elizabeth of Bavaria, Which, which was um, famous tight lacer and also she was uh, obsessed by her own figure, her silhouette, her being... She had problems. <laughs> she had problems she, she, uh, and many tight lacers were extremists. You were not forced to wear a tight corset. You Well, you had to wear one, like you have to wear a bra nowadays if you have a prominent bust. If you go around without bra, it will look at you weirdly. It was the same. Okay. And the very, very last one, they did not have ribs removed. Surgery back then was extremely dangerous. Hospital killed people. They did not have sanitifications and uh, antibiotics. So if they cut you, you were very, very likely to die. <laughs> and because of sepsis and, uh, and infections, and you, you, no one sane of mind would have had a rib removed for corsetry. So, thank you very much for listening. If you Thanks, have, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Yes. And uh, if you have more questions, again, uh, write it in a comment and we will try to reply. Thanks again. Grazie mille a tutti quanti e ci vediamo la prossima volta. Sì, magari facciamo qualcos'altro. Blabber about next time. Oh, we got uh, we got an event. We got is uh, it's gonna be in Italian. Yes. On the eighth. Yes. On the eighth, we will be What's talking. Uh, in, um, we will be uh, guests at the Ottocento Padova Festival. We took part of a couple years ago already, and we will talk about uh, a beauty routine. Um, The routine shoes. Yeah. Elena, Elena is studying uh, antique magazines to find out what Victor late Victorian and early Edwardian beauty routine was like. And I will talk about differences between modern and uh, antique shoes. And I will show the construct how uh, an original 1895 more or less uh, walking practice. Yeah was uh, is, was made yes how, no, how it was constructed we will we will examine the antique one i will not be making things on li live no thank But you it's gonna be italian so yes quindi l'8 dicembre alle 18 avremo poi link siamo ospiti dell'800 parola festival come due anni fa ovviamente questa volta non di persona purtroppo eh, parleremo, Chiara analizzerà un giacchino originale, parleremo della differenza tra scarpe d'epoca e moderne ed Elena ci racconterà della beauty routine di fine ottocento. Non vedo ora. <ride> Neanche Grazie. io. Grazie a tutti. Buona Senti. serata e a presto. Bye! Bye! Bye bye!